Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial. Today I will be explaining various features of Wireshark and its interface. So we can we can begin from where we left off. You have an interface list here and as you know you can pick an individual interface to listen on or you can pick to listen on all of them. Aside from this you can also click on interface list and here you are prompted with this window where you are able at, where you are actually able to pick multiple interfaces that you wish to listen on but not all of them so i don't know i can pick uh, my wired interface and i can pick my wireless interface to listen on and as you can see it is not connected so you see none 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 and it's gray it's not colored it's not black this is also one of the one of the ways one of more universal ways, I would say, to determine which interfaces are functional, uh, where the packets are coming in and out, which ones are working, and so on and so forth. So you can just see here where the packets are going th through uh, PHP1, that's the active one, and apparently my USB as well, because I have things that are plugged in there, a lot of things that are plugged in there through a single USB port. but. You get you get you get the general idea behind this interface list menu. So I'm just gonna go ahead and close it. Also, there is a very nice feature here under capture. You click on it, and you see there is this last line. It says last option. It says refresh interfaces. Now, since all of my interfaces are up, and since I know for a fact that Wireshark sees all of them, this option doesn't make much sense. But here, let me do a let me do a small demonstration here. So I have my VLP2S0 wireless interface, and it is up. But I will just uh, I'm just gonna open up my terminal, and we'll bring it down. So here we go. I'm gonna go if config, and it's gonna list out all of my interfaces that are up. You see, the VLP2S0 wireless interface is up, but it is not running at the moment. However, if I just, uh, I do need to be root for this. I'm just going to relog. Under. There we go. And will it go? No, it will not. Authentication failure. So just one more time. I can't believe how many times I've got my password wrong. And my passwords are ridiculous. I can tell you that much. Usually, I don't know, I have some of them which are 20 characters long. But that's besides the point. We just, we're just going to bring the interface down now. Big and VLP to a zero down. There we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna show to you that it is actually down and not being shown or displayed here. There we go. So we have three interfaces that are listed here, but my wireless interface is not. However, if I go back into Wireshark, you can see that it is still listed here, even though it is down. That's why we need to refresh and pay attention to the VLP to a zero to the one that is highlighted now. Just refresh interfaces and it's gone. It's no longer here. Wireshark has figured out that it is down. However, this is not a real life scenario. A real life scenario would be you starting up Wireshark and you're in without bringing up your interface before that. So when you started up your Wireshark, your interface is not going to show here primarily because it's down. And then you remember, oh, okay, I need to bring it up. And you go ahead and open up your terminal or some other way of bringing your interface up. And you say, I config VLP to a zero up. There we go. And then you confirm that it is up. And here, yeah, here you can see it here. VLP to zero is up. And okay, you open, you go back to your Wireshark and now you want to start a live capture, but hey, your interface is not listed here. So what do you do? Well, if you haven't guessed it already, you just kind of you just go to capture and refresh interfaces. You click on it. There we go. It has recognized VLP to a zero my wireless interface. No problems. So just a bit of a trick or a tip here: what you can do in case you didn't bring your interface up or in case your interface was not listed here. So any changes that you make to the system in regard to the interfaces. Uh, Wireshark probably won't catch them by default. You do need to do cap. You do need to click on capture and then refresh interfaces, and then it's going to pull a new set of information and be able to display them here for you. Next up, we have uh, edit, and then we go into preferences. Just click on it. It's all the way at the bottom, 
and you will be prompted with this window where there are a lot of options. Let me just say that, there are a lot of options here. So we'll begin from the trivial ones and moved, move on down to the technical ones. So over here you have user interface, its layout, and how do you want it to actually appear before you. If you just read through all of these things here, uh, they're pretty much self-explanatory. I mean, save window position, save window size, save maximized state. I actually don't know what this one is, but it's not important at all. Uh, this is just how it looks like nothing more. Right there, you click on layout. Now here is something interesting that you can do. So you have three panels when you start a packet capture session. They can be pos their positions can be like this one two three and this is how they are at the moment, but you can also have you can also have them spread out like this like this, or you can have any of these variants here. Aside from that, each pane can be assigned these attributes of a sort. So you can say, okay, I want number one, I want pane number one to display packet lists, while pane number two shall display, I don't know, packet bytes, and pane three can display packet lists. So it doesn't have to be configured as it is configured here and now. You can configure it any way you like, whatever, whatever suits you, whatever suits you basically. So we go down, next up it's columns, and here we have some interesting things in the technical sense as well. So this is these are this is basically the information that is to be displayed upon uh, s when the session begins, when the capture actually begins. So these columns you have number number of a packet, you have the time uh, when it was captured, uh, source address, destination address. These are IP addresses. Uh, protocol packet length in terms of bytes and some general inform and some information about it. But in addition to that, you can just click here on add and it creates a new column for you. So you have two fields that you can fill in. You have the name of the column. So you can na you can put here whatever you want. It makes no difference. I would advise to put something in that will associate with the information that you wanted to display, but for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to type in uh, no, not something, but whatever. Just to demonstrate that this doesn't have any bearing on this. This is uh, purely for your comfort. And then you just click on it, go ahead, and there's this, uh, it says field type, just click on it, and here, look at, look at all the information that Wireshark can display in regard to network traffic that it captures. So you can basically tell it to display any of these things. I won't go in great detail here explaining what every one of each and every one of these uh, can do. But rather, instead, when we move on to filters, there we will be dealing with things such as these. Because I'm going to be adding stuff into filters, and we're going to be uh, n we're going to need this for traffic in order to analyze the traffic that we capture and in order to filter it basically. Anyway, you can see that some of the items here are already listed. For example, protocol, the one that is lit in blue now, is already being displayed. So if you just take a look at the left side, you can see that you have a title protocol and you have field type protocol as well. You can add as many as you like, but I would advise you not to do too many because there's only so much that you can fit into a screen and then you have to scroll back and forth. Uh, it's not, it, get, it gets it gets a bit hairy and you can't, you can't get to places. You start missing out on information, so just have it clean, neat, and only that, only the inform have it displayed, only information that you actually require and not some not something that you don't need. So the less redundancy you have, the better it is for you. I'm just going to go ahead and remove this panel. And I'm, now we can go to fonts and colors. There is one thing that I like to do here. Um, I change, I don't change the font itself, but I do like to increase size to 14. I don't know, probably because I'm blind or something like that. Even my doctor says I have perfect eyesight. But there is another reason why I'm doing this. Uh, a lot of information is displayed uh, during a live session capture, and 
I just you spend a lot of time looking at it and it's my personal belief that the bigger the letters are, the bigger the numbers are, the easier it is to spot information of importance. Now that is only my personal preference, that doesn't necessarily need to be the thing that suits you. So just do whatever you wish here, configure it however, you, whatever suits you, change the, uh, change the font if you wish, change the size, whatever. Down below you have colors. You can also uh, play around with colors and how things will be displayed. But I would gen how things will be highlighted, but I generally wouldn't recommend it, primarily because you can have overlapping s colors. So, for example, you can have two things that are of the same color, and when they are displayed, they will cover each other up. So, one of the typical mistakes that can be made, or that some people make, that I have made a long time ago in the past, is basically. I've gave the same text color as the background, which is amazing. I mean, you couldn't see the text. That's why I would recommend just going out onto the net and getting your, get yourself an XML file. Those XML files can contain or for imports, and they can change the color schemes of your interface here. So, for example, if you want a darker interface, you can get you you can get such formats from the net and, and just import them, and it will be set by default for you. That's just a recommend. That's just a personal recommendation. But I'm obviously not going to do anything here now, as the default layout is perfectly fine for this course. Anyway, we're now going to go down into capture. And here there are some very, very interesting things. For example, you can configure your default interface, so you do not need to f you do not need to specify it every time you start the Wireshark up. So, for example, I can either type in p8p1 and say that that will be my interface, or I can go ahead and click here, and I'm going to have a drop-down menu. And I can pick an interface from it in case I don't know which one it is, in case I don't know the name for it. Now this is very important here. It says capture packets in promiscuous mode on all network cards. Now there are two modes with which, with which we shall deal. You have promiscuous mode and when a network card functions in a promiscuous mode it means that it will only and only process traffic that is meant directly for it. And if it's running in monitor mode pretty much all traffic that it comes by, it's going to take it, process it, and you will be able to see it. Very important for LAN networks or something of a kind, primarily because you can spoof the network and see what's going on on it, you can capture information, and it can be, actually, it is a pretty, pretty bad security risk. Anyway, down below you have some of the, th some of the th some of the display things, for example, automatic scrolling in live capture, definitely have that ticked, and update packets in real time, but these things are configured by default, so no worries there. For example, it's going to scroll automatically for you, but if you manually scroll up, it will stop the scrolling process. Very nice feature, I will show all this a bit later on, once we actually start the capture, and once we actually start uh, dealing with filters themselves. So we're gonna go down and hit filter expressions, see what happens here. So you, here you can add filters and yeah, so la you have it enabled label and filter expression. Keep in mind that you can create multiple profiles in Wireshark and every profile you can design to do a specific thing to capture specific packets so you don't need to like do the configuration over and over and over again on the same profile rather instead you can configure one profile to do one thing and another to do another thing and then when Wireshark starts just choose the one that you want and that's it uh, here you can create a list of custom filters uh, for the profiles so I'm just going to go ahead and remove that because we don't really need any custom filters for the time being. Uh, go and go ahead and jump down into name resolution. So here you have uh, here we go resolve MAC addresses. We've sp we talked about them a bit before. 
uh, resolve transport names, resolve network IP addresses, use external network name resolvers, etc. etc. So up to here, up to up to enable concurrent DNS name resolution, that is what we want to that, that is what we want to look at for the time being. You can disregard the rest except for except for this one. You have GeoIP database directories. So these things are available on the net and you can download them but keep in mind that you will always need to update them and they are not always for precise for example in terms of countries they are they can always assign IP addresses to correct countries but when you come down to the cities oh that can be that can be a bit tricky there is always there is a mistakes are bound to happen there so this is something that you would obviously need to download from the internet. It's just a it's just a file you download it, and there you go. And you basically click edit here. I'm just gonna show it to you. Uh, new. There you go. So now you can pick it here from wherever you wish. It's bound to be some. I don't know. It depends where you install it, and from there it will be it will be accessible to you so you just need to go to GUIP database directory I have a different tool for that which I can update rather fast and with greater ease perhaps we can discuss it in some of the further tutorials as we go on into the into the actual practical part into some exercises and into some real life scenarios but for the time being just be aware of it that that is a possibility uh, printing, we can just go ahead and skip that, self-explanatory, and there aren't even that many options anyway. Now I'm going to go ahead and click on protocols, and I don't want you to freak out or anything of a kind. Uh, there's going to be a lot of them, and we are not going to go through all of them, there's no need, but we will go through those that are used on daily basis, uh, those that you are most likely to encounter, because let's face it i mean even the most of even most experienced network admins are not likely to encounter all of these protocols not during their lifetime they usually uh are they usually are very specific and they deal with very uh, specific stuff that are predefined in advance they won't need to know all of these things cuz that that would be i mean you just you can have some sort of general knowledge of what they are but that's about it uh, as far as requirements go. However, like T TCP, UDP, IP, such stuff, you r such protocols, you really, really, really need to know. They are used on daily basis, and we will deal with them in great detail a bit later on once we actually start the capture process, and once you can see all those small segments that give you a ton load of information. Down below you have statistics. Uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna skip this for now. This there's there's no point. Uh, nothing nothing of importance lies here. So I'm just gonna click OK. And I am running out of time here, so I will make a part two for this uh, for this particular tutorial. So this will be a two part tutorial. We'll have next time when we come around we're gonna actually go into the live back live capture and we're gonna see what we can actually do there and what sort of options we have in that part so in any case I bid you farewell and I thank you for your time